Hello everybody <clears throat> and welcome to my channel. This is a long overdue video on just what I have to say on Emma Sean Copeland's and Flushing Freedom and I think it should help you all out a lot while you're writing your papers so I strongly encourage you to um, listen through this insofar as it's helpful to you. <clears throat> but and somebody emailed me saying, I guess they enjoyed tuna so much that they said, can we meet some of your pets every video? Well, maybe these pets aren't what <clears throat> he was wanting to see. Maybe they were. They aren't furry. But this is my spouse's tank. It's got angelfish in it, certainly. But you can't see them very well when they're looking straight at you, so. But there's, this is a pretty one. There's algae on the glass. But again, you can't see her. Okay, you can see her now. When they look at you, they just look like a line. Uh, her name's Smokey. Uh, and this is an autosynclus. Autosynclus, whatever. There's about ten of them in there. Up there you got some Congo Tetras, two males, two females. And then back there you got like a, probably like a six or seven inch long feather fin catfish who my spouse has had for, I don't know, probably five years. But the most exciting thing I want to introduce you to, if I can find them, Where are they? They move them so quickly. I can't even keep track of them. What in the heck? Oh, there they are. They're in the shadow. Sorry about that. But this is a Kerbenzi cichlid, a female Kerbenzi cichlid. I don't know why it's twitching. That's my spouse's problem. <clears throat> and this is the male Kerbenzi cichlid. And they laid eggs in this log over here. And now they've got fry, like little fry that they guard. Uh, they have them under the leaf. So you can't see them that well. You can see them moving a little bit. Those are little baby uh, Kerbenzi cichlid fry. I think this water really needs to be changed. Isn't that a beautiful fish? That's the female. They usually take turns guarding the fry and they lead them around the tank. Like you can see a couple at the bottom there. We lead them around the tank to let them eat algae and try to help them get bigger. Uh, you can see them moving. That's a little cloud. Yeah. They're moving now. And the mother and father take turns terrorizing the other fish in the tank. The female <clears throat> is a very pretty fish. Very nice looking fish. She was actually bred from <clears throat> a fish that my spouse used to have who unfortunately died. This is the male. The female is actually prettier right now. But yeah. And of course, these plants, they're looking amazing. When my spouse planted these plants, and they've been growing <clears throat> with their actual aquatic plants. And this one is grown up with a vine up there, and this one's growing up with a vine. And when the vine gets to the surface, it'll sprout a flower. So, at least that's how it's been with other plants. 
but I'm sorry. Now I need to get down to business. I need to get down to business. <clears throat> so I'll just have a wide pan on this tank while I <laughs> tell you what you need to know. So <clears throat> there was some audio issues with the last two, so um I just want to make sure you can hear this really well. Maybe I can find another way in the future for you to hear me better while looking at me. But, <clears throat> so in In Fleshing Freedom, the, wo the woman is theologian, M. Sean Copeland, who actually was one of my um, advisors, professors, so she's kind of like a grandmother professor to me. But Copeland, like Emily Towns, <clears throat> she's describing race as a social construct. It's a social construct that's nevertheless based on Sorry, one of my cats is screaming. They really, um, she's not being heard at all. She's just really grouchy. The race <clears throat> for Copeland is a, is a social construct. It's based on the physical attribute of skin tone. And for both Towns and Copeland, race is real, in quotes, only in that it has consequences for how human beings interact and perceive themselves in the world. And then for Copeland, racism, importantly, which he also describes as sinful later, spoiler alert, a racism is a phenomenon that's brought about <clears throat> when, quote, skin morphs into a horizon funded by bias. And what does that mean? It's a horizon funded by bias. Well, when you look at the, when you're watching the sunset and the sun goes down over the horizon, it's invisible, right? So you have a certain horizon, like the horizon point is the point where you stop being able to see the sun. So skin morphs into a horizon funded by bias means that you can't see certain people once their skin is of a certain tone. So to continue, Copeland theorized, I mean not like literally see people, but you know, like value them and notice them and everything. Yeah. <clears throat> so to move on, Copeland theorizes racism as a quote, racially bias induced horizon unquote, a vision, which hides the other from one and renders the other invisible. So our horizon, let's just say, like our field of vision, it abruptly halts. And like when I say R, I'm not sure who I mean exactly, but I think she's she's talking about um, white people's horizon of vision, actually. So, um, or I mean, maybe you know, colorism is a thing everywhere too. I'm just gonna say um, for Copeland people's horizon, people's field of vision, abruptly halts before it sees or considers the racially other in the context of a racially bias induced horizon. Now this causes, like I said, the racially other to become invisible. <clears throat> to the racially privileged. And then frequently what is seen, actually, are stereotypical patterns rather than insights brought on by like actual data. So um, just to go back to our very first day of class, or our second day of class, as political theorist Iris Marion Young pointed out, cultural imperialism assumes that the dominant group's perspective is all there is 
and it renders simultaneously it renders the non-dominant group simultaneously both invisible and hypervisible. Uh, at the same time that the socially dominant are like, mentally erasing the subjectivity of the non-dominant, the non-dominant are marked out and stereotyped. So the actual subjectivity of the non-dominant is invisible. These stereotypes are hypervisible. So an instantaneous being seen and being not seen occurs in a remarkable fashion. Um, and this is kind of me extrapolating off of Young and Copeland. The hypervisibility of the oppressed is stereotypes. It renders them invisible also, since they're not being truly seen, right? Even in the sense in which they are seen through these stereotypes, they're not being truly seen for who they are. So, in the context of a racially biased induced horizon for Copeland, quote, members of the privileged group are conditioned to withdraw from unnecessary contact with other non-privileged members of society, thereby depriving themselves of human and humane relationships, unquote. In other words, participating in racism as a bias-induced horizon of seeing detracts from the soundness of your ethical comportment by stunting the human capacity for meaningful, freely loving relationships. So for Copeland, racism is more than an observable racially biased induced horizon. After all, she's a theologian, she's an ethicist, and the phenomenon of racism, it has a moral and a theological significance for her. So for Copeland, racism is a personal and social sin in which occurs the breakdown of human solidarity and the loss, and quote, the loss of our humanness, end quote. She says, I'm not sure that you have, um, it's on page 109, I'm not sure I assigned this part, but she says, racism, quote, spoils the spirit and insults the holy. It is idolatry. So I think that's really important to note, like, um, that <clears throat> she's perceiving racism as sinful and as idolatry. Oh, well, how is it idolatry? You might wonder. Well, it's simply because I think that, um, this bizarre human thing of a horizon funded by skin tone is being elevated above divine ends like the flourishing of creation it's this kind of um you know and some people even say that i don't know if you heard this story but there's some lady in alabama who wouldn't let an interracial couple get ver get married at her venue because it was quote against her religion well that's how you can kind of absolutize racism like even become convinced that it's part of your religion and it becomes an idol that you set up <laughs> over I guess you could say the divine will that creation flourish. The creation was created as good and to, I don't know, prosper. And racism insults the divine by disrupting human solidarity, disrupting, um, human flourishing, but also I guess it's kind of an insult against the fact that 
God created human beings in the Imago Dei, in the image of God. So that's another kind of an insult to the holy when the image of God is so little respected in human beings. So <clears throat> those are some different ways I think it could be that I think she means um, that it's idolatrous. Racism's idolatrous. It's a personal and social sin. So Copeland, you know, this is all in chapter one, mostly. She's writing about what racism is, how it's sinful, uh, but she, as you see in chapter five, importantly, she has a moral and a theological response. So she's got a moral and a theological critique, and she gives her response. She argues in this response powerfully for the necessity of recognizing the church as Christ's crucified body on earth. So her moral and theological response centers around the church ecclesiology. She relies on the idea that the mystical body of Christ is knitted and joined together, to use a biblical phrase, in solidarity. And how? By the ritual, ritual of the Eucharist, or the Lord's Supper, like that, that point um, in churches where they feed you crackers and grape juice, or maybe not grape juice, it really depends. <clears throat> But uh, the mystical body of Christ is knitted and joined together in solidarity by this ritual. And it's by means of this ritual that Christ's body is incorporated into and made present with his body on earth, the church. And Copeland is Catholic. And she, you know, is all in on the doctrine of transubstantiation articulated by Thomas Aquinas and that basically means that um, <clears throat> that what happens like you have bread and wine right and when it's blessed and consecrated by the priest at your church for Catholics that's when it becomes like in some mystical fashion mysterious uh, fashion it becomes like transubstantiated, the substances change so that the bread is actually in some way the body of Christ and the wine becomes the blood of Christ and when you take in that bread and that wine you're actually like taking in some of Christ's body to you like literally taking in some of Christ's body to you and when you do that in a group with a whole bunch of people, like you're all at the same time taking Christ's body and blood into your own body and blood, but you're also incorporating yourselves into that, um, into Christ's body on earth, which is the church. Like you all are <clears throat> all becoming part of Christ and that makes you and makes it so that you are all becoming part of the same body, like as a community. Um, and so, for Copeland, that's really important. Like, that is the crux of what she wants to say. Um, so, for Copeland, the Eucharist, it makes visible the mystical body of humanity raised up by Christ. And the Eucharist, as such, again, its unifying solidaristic function is a, quote, countersign to the encroaching reign of sin, unquote, in which reign racism has flourished as an intrinsic evil. So earlier in her book, um, Copeland's done some work like making 
black women especially the subjects the subjects um, from which she's doing theology and she says that in the context of the lives of the proper subjects of theological anthropology that is black persons who have experienced slavery lynching and white racist supremacy the Eucharist is functioning and this is important and this is really similar to what Towns is saying the Eucharist is functioning as a quote counter imagination you got an imagination which is the racist imagination then the Eucharist it helps provide a counter imagination to resacralize black flesh right because human flesh becomes sacred sacred when it's incorporated into Christ's body on earth through the Eucharist and then the Eucharist <clears throat> brings the larger community into solidarity with the cause not only of black flesh but also of the despised flesh of all oppressed people so for Copeland Eucharistic solidarity is her guiding concept in reflections on the church like it is her response to the racially biased induced horizon so Eucharistic solidarity like I said gets when it is formed when Christians partake together of the body and blood of Christ Christians from all um, races classes ages etc they're all alike incorporated into the body of Christ and Eucharistic solidarity the key term has the power to challenge Christians to live out of a sense of oneness sense of oneness with all of the members of the body of Christ and Eucharistic solidarity has the power to challenge a racially bias induced horizon of seeing that constricts human beings ability to like, notice and value and pay attention to people um, on the basis of race so it is the body of Christ the church that becomes a new horizon of vision across which Christian seeing is called to expand to embrace all people whom Christ embraces and as we know from past courses Christ right um, embraced the outcasts of every sort in fact was an outcast so this has really um, it has tremendous ethical implications for what the church should be doing on earth so as Christ's body according to Copeland one is called to oppose quote all intentionally divisive segregation of the specious grounds of preference for race or gender or sexual orientation and so this is also relevant to queer theology like I think you know a lot of churches I would say definitely more churches consider themselves to be progressive on race than they do on sexual orientation like there will be churches who are all about like Pentecostal churches who are all about like, accepting people no matter their race but they still have serious hang-ups about LGBTQ people so I mean, think about it this way like the being incorporated into the body of Christ is a way to for churches to expand their horizon of vision to see value in LGBTQ people and also like I don't want to speak too much from the perspective of the dominant group right um, because when it like um, when a um, when a person for example like from a non-dominant group comes into a church and they find themselves like eating the body and the blood of Christ and becoming incorporated in Christ's body like they're 
Like it's a re-sacralization of their flesh, like um, making their flesh sacred in their own eyes again if they struggle with that. Um, and getting that feeling of um, solidarity, Christ being in solidarity with you and you being worthy of love, um, all this kind of thing. Like, so I don't want to speak just too much from the point of view of the oppressor, like needing to see the value in these and other people, but from the point of view of someone with marginalized identities, this can also be a really um, kind of an inspiring way of thinking where like, when you take in the Eucharist, like, your own vision is expanded to value yourself and love yourself, I think. Uh, but <clears throat> you all can think about that more. Um, so there's one other thing that's important here. Let me see. So for Copeland, the sacrament of the Eucharist, it serves as a peaceful, like we said, counter-imagination or counter-sign to the reign of violence afflicting black people in the U.S. <clears throat> Copeland, she emphasizes that Christ's body on earth is properly concerned with Christ as the one who was tortured and abused by the imperial state. Now, in vivifying this, quote, dangerous memory, it's a dangerous memory of Christ in the world today, the church necessarily becomes, quote, oriented to the cross of the lynched Jesus of Nazareth, unquote, and stirs Christians to embrace with an expansive vision and with love and hope those who in their bodies are despised and marginalized. Um, especially those lynched black bodies of history as Christ was also lynched with whom Christ remains in solidarity but Christ infuses his church with spirit, the Holy Spirit, that motivates his members to take up the work of embodying the dangerous memory of Christ by opting for solidarity with the oppressed. Now Copeland adds that Christians as the church, quote, strive to, try, strive to become what we have received and to do what we are being made." Unquote. For Copeland, Christians are striving to become what they have received as a gift from God. They are striving to actualize the virtue of Eucharistic solidarity, which has been given to them in the, the setup of the church, right? As a gift, um, animated by the Holy Spirit that is Christ's body. And Christians are striving to actualize the Imago Dei, the image of God in themselves, which is another gift, divine gift, by being humane in their humanity and being oriented toward a God who makes a preferential option for the oppressed. They are striving to do in the present, what they are being made in a process extending into the future. The church for Copeland, it's a liminal space, liminal space, on the threshold, in between the violent reign of sin against which, for her, Christians properly strive particularly through means of Eucharistic solidarity. Uh, 
Um, so the church is a liminal space in between, on the threshold between the violent reign of sin and the reign of grace. And I hope what I had to say is helpful to you all as you're trying to write your papers. I really hope it was. They have their fry out more now, you can see. These fry. They're tiny little things, they're striped. That's cute, huh? They got plenty of algae to eat down there. And their parents tell them where to go. The parents say jump, they say how high, because they don't want to get eaten. Because they will be eaten. Probably mostly by this catfish. Okay, so have a good rest of your day. I hope this was a helpful lecture. And um, please let me know if you have any questions.